like, wow, there's a lot of you out there. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. So um, first of all, let me introduce some family here. First would be my beautiful wife, Lola. Uh, combined, now you heard Dave say that uh, my first wife is with the Lord. He blessed me with this one here. And combined, we have uh, six children and 17 grandchildren. So wow. I know we are, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, and so we are blessed. Sitting next to my beautiful wife is lovely Amanda. Um, and actually, you ditched church today. You're actually at church, but you ditched your home church. But we're glad to have you. That's her husband, Donald. Amanda is, uh, you know, Dave would tell you he has a, a shortstop on the team. And that would be somebody that does a little bit of everything uh, to take care of business and hold things together. And that's my Amanda. So I can't wait to hear what happened at my home church now that you're over here with me. But thanks for coming. That's her husband, uh, Donald. So um, Dave is an awesome brother. And uh, he actually helped plant our church some, I think, 12, 13 years ago. And, um, you know, he's amazing. He just rolls with things and he knows a lot of stuff. And we didn't know anything. So even now, all these years later, when the wheels come off for whatever reason, I can call him. He's going to tell me the truth. He's going to tell me how to fix it. Um, you may find this hard to believe, but I screw up a lot of things. So uh, I'm blessed to have Dave. Um, he's just a wonderful friend. So, um, you know, I was thinking and I, I said something silly I thought was going to be funny to the first service. So the cat's out of the bag. I'll say it again. You know, Dave planting our church, and then we're all God's children together. We're kind of like your stepsisters, right? I mean, we're, we're okay, well, it's better than first service, but anyway. All right, I think that's the Lord saying, let's look at his word. If you have your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 16. Dave, did you say something funny back there? Uh-huh. Acts chapter 16, if you have your Bible, and if not, that's fine. It should be easy enough to follow along. Um, I am leaving a week from tomorrow to go to the Ukraine. Uh, we are working with two groups of two organizations over there. And um, it's, it's, I'm excited. I've never been to that part of the world. Most of my travel has been to the Middle East and to the Arab nations. Uh, we work primarily with churches that are pers persecuted and specifically for the pastors of those churches. We we want to lift them up and we want to support them and encourage them and keep them doing what they do. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. We sit back, especially in this day and age in our country, and we complain about the price of gas as we should. We complain about the economy, what's happened with our kids, how things are handled. It's, it's horrible, I agree, but uh, nothing like the Arab nations. And they are very, very heavy-handed and... Um, you know, everywhere we, go, everywhere we go to meet with people, we will find out that we had been followed or, you know, we're being watched. It's just, you know, now we're used to it. But it's a strange thing. Um, it's a strange thing. So going into Europe will be something new for me. I'm looking forward to it. Same type of thing. We're working with pastors primarily. Out of, we're going into Romania. That'll be our base but we will be traveling across the border into the Ukraine, working with young pastors of young churches that have been planted in the last five or 10 years and just trying to see how we can keep them going. Uh, the goal is in late October, early November, we would bring a team from our church over there and um, minister to some widows and, and orphans, which there's no shortage of over there, as you know. So be praying for us as, as we move forward with that. I must say that um, I know we've all been called to do something, and you know that as well. I love being the shepherd, the pastor of the Refuge Christian Fellowship. It is, um, it is a wonderful thing. But I can tell you that when the Lord opens these doors and I get to travel into these uttermost parts of the world, there's nothing like it. And uh, to see the faith in these people that have so little and that are going through so much is just a... It's so refreshing. It's convicting, but it's refreshing. Because, you know, I run out of peanut butter, and I think God left me and forsook me, and that's it, you know. And, you know, these, these people are just amazing. It is amazing what they endure, and it's amazing how they love Christ. 
and they're just on fire for the Lord. They're just on fire for the Lord. One more thing before I get started here. Uh, David had mentioned that your youth group had uh, taken a break. We are a very small congregation. We're about 100 people. And we finally, after all these years, were able to find a sucker, I mean, a young man to take over our youth. And, you know, I never had any idea. I'd been praying for it for years. And I never had any idea what kind of character it takes to be that guy. And so we bring this guy on, and he's, he's considered staff. He gets paid. And about a month into it, he says to me, he goes, Bill, I got this great idea. And I said, well, what's that, Cameron? And he goes, we're going to have a lockdown for two nights. All the kids at the church, for two nights, we're going to lock them in. And I'm going, what in the good Lord's name are you thinking? Why would you do that? You know, but it's amazing how these guys just love the kids. I, I mean, to me, they're just a different species, these teenagers. I don't know where they come from, but we are blessed to have that. So I can certainly understand why your guy got uh, some time off. I, I just... I just think that's an awesome thing. Let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. We'll get started. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for who you are, Lord, and um, how you've changed our lives. We pray you would do that again today. We know your word does not come back void. We pray you would open our hearts. You would fill us with your spirit. We would leave here with more than what we came with, and we would be changed, Lord, and more like your son. So open up, Lord. Pour into us. We love you and praise you in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So with your Bibles open to Acts chapter 16, you've got a, an interesting story. And it's kind of a case study, if you will. And of all the people Luke could have picked, because thousands were coming to the Lord, we've got these three people front and center that I want to talk about today. And uh, it'll begin with Paul. And we're told in, in chapter 16, verse 6, that, that Paul was forbidden by the Holy Spirit to go into Asia. This would have been modern-day Turkey. And so Paul, we don't know how he was forbidden. We don't know if, if he had heard an audible voice. We don't know how that was, but he knew he wasn't to go there. And then it says that all of a sudden, in verse 9, it says that he, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to, to Macedonia and help us. It says that after he'd seen the vision, immediately we went into Macedonia. Two things to pick up on there. First of all, Paul's obedience was wonderful. Not knowing what he's getting into, number one. And the other thing is, you see the word we used for the first time in this book. Dr. Luke is the author, the guy that wrote the Gospel of Luke. Okay, He just inserted himself into the picture. He's now traveling full-time with Paul. Kind of interesting. So you've got Paul, Silas, a young man named Timothy, which you've all heard of, and now we have Dr. Luke on the scene. Paul has this vision, God has a plan. And he tells him, I want you to go into this region. Paul's obedience, you know, he's, he's there. Um, it says that he has concluded that the Lord called us to preach the gospel to him. So then it says, it goes on to say in verse 11, that sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course. If you were to look at Acts chapter 20, you would see that the same trip was made and it is a five-day trip. In this case, it was a two-day trip. And when you have the power of the Holy Spirit behind you and pushing your sails, you will go wherever he calls you to go and you will get there in his time. I just think that's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing. They get into Philippi and it says that they were staying in that city. On the Sabbath day, they went into the city to the riverside. They did not go to a synagogue. They did not have a synagogue yet. They weren't large enough. You had to have 10 Jewish men before they would build a synagogue. But what you did in the place of a synagogue, you would meet in the open air somewhere by water. Could be a river, could be the ocean. And you went there and you prayed together. So Paul knew enough to do that because it says it was, it was a custom. It was a custom and it says, and they sat down and they spoke to the women there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. Let's go back to where we began. We are now in a Roman colony. We're working our way toward the United States, actually. And if Paul had not have been obedient and gone in this direction, we would not have gotten the church and the Bible the way we did. It all began on this trip. And this is the direction that Paul is going. So we've got this woman from Thyatira, a seller of purple. 
she would have extracted dye purple and provided clothing in the dye for the Romans. Romans loved wearing red. They loved wearing purple. We see her, and her name is Lydia. We will see later on she has children with don't see a husband. She owned this business. She was a businesswoman, probably very, very intelligent. Okay? So Paul is told, go see a man in Macedonia. He goes down there. He goes by the riverside. He sees women praying. He meets this lady this woman who sells purple dye, and she's worshiping God. Now, this wouldn't have been the same way Paul worshiped God. She was seeking something. She was there looking for religion is what she was doing. Something else to point out. She was closing shop, closing business on Sabbath. She was seriously seeking something, okay? It wouldn't have been the same God that Paul worshiped. She hadn't met him yet. Why do I say that? Because it says that she worshipped God. It was, a, it was a common thing for Gentiles to have what was the, the Bible in that day and to seek God and do as the Jews did. So what she was looking for was religion. Okay, She thought she was looking for God. She was looking for religion. And then we see that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. What would that have been like? Well, Paul, being a devout Jew, would have known everything that she was reading in what she had as a Bible. And he would have said, hey, these feasts that you're talking about, these feasts that you're reading about, let me tell you about those. They all point to a man named Jesus Christ. And let me tell you what he did for you. And he reasoned with her. She was an intelligent woman. Paul was an intelligent man. And the Lord had brought her down there to begin with. And we know the Lord had sent Paul down there to meet her. Where is the man from Macedonia? There is no man from Macedonia. It was Lydia. It was a woman from Macedonia. Now, I am speculating and saying this, but I'm guessing as a devout Jew and a man who was a Pharisee, Paul would have never had gone had he known it was a woman. So here he is, and he meets Lydia. He reasons with her. He opens her heart because, actually, the Lord opened her heart, and he used Paul. He gives her the words, and look at what happens. She and her household were baptized. They got saved. It's an amazing thing. You get saved. And then I know that she was a woman of influence because if you know Paul and you're familiar with him, he was a brawler. He was a man's man. Paul was a, uh, he did things his way. So here you've got a woman that he probably wouldn't even have gone to see had he known it was a woman. And it says that she begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Well, I know no one can persuade me like my wife and the Holy Spirit. This woman got a hold of Paul and said, you and your team are going to stay. And they did. And I just think that's awesome. So we have our first case study. We got Paul and his obedience We've got the Holy Spirit in caring about this woman who's seeking some kind of God. And then we've got Lydia who's faithful. Her and her family are baptized and they receive. Moving forward, now we're going to meet this young girl. All we know about this young girl is it says a certain slave girl. She was owned by men. She was a fortune teller. They made a lot of money. It says it was a lucrative business. She was also demon-possessed. So let's think about this for a minute. No different than one of our girls. Did she have a mom and dad? What was this like? What was this like? All of a sudden, their daughter's gone. All of a sudden, all they hear is she's demon-possessed. She's working for these men as a fortune teller. I can tell you it is an evil thing. I have seen many people that are possessed. It is an evil thing. I was sharing with the, with, with, uh, the first service that I remember a while back. We were in Haiti, and the pastor would spend one night a week. Uh, it was usually Wednesday nights. He called it a deliverance service. And people that gone to the congregation, people that went to the church, would bring friends and family members in who were possessed. And he would spend the whole night delivering demons. He even had, uh, it was a huge building, and he had rooms set up with mattresses. And once you were exhausted, if you were possessed by a demon, and once he delivered you from a demon, he had, uh, the deacons would go, and they would sit in that room and pray over you when you went to sleep. And you didn't get a lot of sleep when you were possessed. So we had met this young girl and her mom. 
And we were asking questions through the pastor. And the girl and the mom had explained that two things this demon deprived her daughter of. One was sleep and the other was food. Just enough so she would exist. So she was exhausted. Could you imagine that? And to watch her and to watch her mom. And then her mom shared. She said, you know what? She had a twin sister. And one morning I went to wake up to check on my girls. And my other daughter was dead. And she believes the demon inside, her one daughter, had killed the other one. Could you imagine? Demonic presence is a horrible thing. So here's this young slave girl, not just a slave to the demons, but a slave to society, a slave to these men to make them money. What a horrible existence. But you know who sees that? You know who sees the tears? You know who knows the pain? Our Lord. What does he do? First of all, let me point something out that's interesting. We got Lydia, a businesswoman, looking for something, not sure what she's looking for. We're going to meet another guy, a prison guard, a jailer, and he's not looking for anything. Now we got this demon-possessed people, of all people, and she is crying out, following Paul and his posse around, and she's following them, and she's yelling, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. She was the only one of the group that knew who Christ was, yet she was in the worst shape of all of them. Now, God doesn't need demon-possessed people to do his marketing, you know, so he's going to take care of this right now. And how he does that is, so she's following Paul and the boys around for many days, and it says, but Paul, greatly annoyed, no kidding, turned and he said to the spirit i command you in the name of jesus christ to come out of her and he came out of her that very hour a lot of things happened let's talk about the good things that happened this young girl was freed she was freed she couldn't have been around family she couldn't have been around anybody she loved going back to the woman that we met whose daughter was possessed she was sharing how she knew her thoughts she had sound thoughts so she was processing things that she was seeing and the demon kept her from, from speaking. So imagine trying to share the pain that you're experiencing and you can't because the demon won't let it come out. And being alert and aware of those thoughts and yet not being able to communicate. That's what this girl had here. And now she's free. Now she's totally free. And I can tell you, as we can see here, you know, Jesus is bad for some businesses, and this is one of those businesses right here. Praise the Lord. It says, but when our master saw that the hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. They go to the magistrates. They go, hey, this is what this guy did. We've been making all this money and probably paying them taxes, and now we can't because he saved her life, basically. What do they do? It says they tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now, go back to Paul. Here's Paul, spent wonderful time with Lydia, leads her to the Lord. Wow, this mission stuff is cool. You know, meets this girl, this young slave girl. She's possessed and Paul delivers her. And you know, he's thinking, wow, the power of the Holy Spirit, this is amazing. And then after that, he finds himself getting arrested and beaten. And this wasn't a normal beating. His back would have been flayed open. He would have been a mess. And that's the way they had handled him. They commanded them to beat him with rods. It says they laid many stripes on them, threw them into prison, and commanding the jail to keep them securely. Then it says in verse 24, having received such a charge, he put him in the inner prison and fastened their feet with stocks. Stocks would have been a long piece of wood that would have had notches in it. And what, you would, what they would do is have you spread your feet as far as you can, slip your ankles in those notches, and then put another notch in front. Now you could barely stand up, okay? More than likely, you always sat down after that or you laid on your back. What did we just hear happen to his back? So imagine the pain that he was experiencing. How angry would you be if you were Paul being obedient to what God had told you to do and the reward for that obedience is to get beaten with rods and put in prison? 
that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And like I said, Paul was a man's man. So obviously, he's going to get even, right? Let's see how Paul handles this. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. What? Who does that? Church, Paul was more free in chains and in stocks than he was outside. Why? Because he had Christ in his heart. Isn't that amazing? You know, when our circumstance, when our life goes sideways, don't you sit back and you kind of do an inventory. What did I say wrong? What did I do wrong? Why is God getting me? There's no getting me. God's going to use this to his glory. And sometimes we don't like it. Sometimes it's going to bring pain, but guess what? We are his kids. He allowed his kid to go for, go through the most pain anybody could ever imagine. Why would he keep us from that? So here's Paul in prison, and he's singing. We meet this jailer. It says, commanding the jailer at the end of 23 to keep them secure. Now, a jailer, especially in a Roman province or a Roman colony, this was a civil service job, probably a retired or a semi-retired Roman soldier, just gravy train kind of thing, getting through it. You know, if you know a cop, or you're married to one, you would say, you know what, cops are great guys for the most part. I have to, I live in a prison town, so I gotta say that. But you know what, they're very practical. They're very methodical. Things need to make sense. So we've got Lydia that's looking for religion. You've got this woman, this young girl that's looking to be freed in any way she can, and we got this jailer who isn't looking for anything but an easy retirement. He knows how bad these men are beaten. And what are they doing? They are singing hymns and praying in jail. And then on top of that, verse 26 says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and the chains fell. That's a heck of an earthquake. We just saw the God factor right there. Isn't that cool? Now, here's the deal. If you were a prison guard or a jailer and any of your prisoners escaped, you suffered the penalty that they were charged with. So if anybody escaped that was charged and were going to go to say to the gas, not the gas chamber, back then they would have been beheaded or, or whatever it would have been, you would have had to take that punishment for them. So this jailer knew Okay, and he was a very practical man. He knew one of these guys escapes, I'm dead. If you look down at 27, it says he drew his sword, he was about to kill himself. He was just going to take care of it. He's a man of honor. He was a cop. This isn't good for me. Someone's going to escape. They're going to kill me. I'm just going to do away with it right now and follow my sword. What happens? Paul yells in a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Paul wouldn't let anybody escape. The guy that was singing, the guy that was praying, the guy that could have ran out of the jail cell, the guy that was saved by God, said, don't anybody move. Stay here. He sees the jailer going to fall on a sword. He says, hey, don't do anything. Don't harm yourself. We are all here. This blew the jailer's mind. He had never seen anything like that. All he had known was hardened criminals. And here's this guy beaten, then he saw the beating, locked him up in stocks, singing Jesus songs, and telling him, don't hurt yourself. That blew this guy's mind. You want to know how I know that? Because verse 30 says, when he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? I want what you got. You're sitting there singing. Your back is flayed open. You're praising this Jesus character. You're not even angry with me, and you don't escape when you have the chance. Who does that? I want what you got. Go back to what we said. Jesus will meet you wherever you were. Lydia needed to be reasoned with. 
This slave girl needed to be freed. This guy needed to see something. This had to be practical to him, and he wasn't even looking for anything. I'll show you something really weird about this, strange to me. If you look down at verse 33, it says, and he took them the same hour and washed their stripes. That means when they got into prison, when they went in, he knew they were all bloody. He knew their backs were flayed open and he didn't do anything for them. But now after he gets saved, he does. I was sharing this with my son. We were talking about it. And I go, I go Matt, look what a creep this guy is. And he goes, no, Dad, look at the first thing he did when he gets Jesus. He becomes kind and shows him grace and shows him love. Church, I don't know what your circumstances are. I have no idea. I do know God is calling us to be the hands and feet of his son. And I do know he is putting people in front of you that he wants you to share that love with. And again, the circumstances I don't think matter. They certainly don't matter to God. And if you're one of his kids, you know how it's going to end. So how are you doing with this challenge? Because it's no different for us than it was with Paul. And I'll tell you something. You guys, are you familiar with the story of Peter having a trance on a roof and a big sheet comes down from heaven? Peter was a, a prejudiced man. And God had to show him something. So while God's using Peter to minister, he's teaching him something. And so Peter's sitting back and God says, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter goes, oh no, I won't eat anything uncommon. And God goes, hey, Pete, anything I made is not common. Rise, kill, and eat, it's all good. He was teaching Peter something because Peter was prejudiced. And I think it's the same with Paul. Paul, as a Pharisee, would have grown up thinking and praying every morning when he woke up, thank you, Lord, I am not a woman, a slave, and a Gentile. And who are his first three converts in Philippi? I love that. I love that. We are told that when all this ends, and when Paul gets out, it says, they went out from prison in verse 40, and they entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, brethren, this is a church. Did Paul show up? and see Lydia in her household, see a slave girl, and see a prison guard in Lydia's house? Was this the beginning of the church that we know as the Church of the Philippians? How amazing is God? Church, what is he doing with you? Who is he putting in front of you? Who does he want you to share the love of God with? Because I can tell you, it is somebody. And I would ask him, I would ask him, Lord, what is it you want me to do? It may just be to pray, but I promise you, you are being asked to do something. We are called to be obedient to this. This is not our home. We are just passing through. But we all need to be busy in doing something. Amen.